Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, um, welcome everybody to, uh, to be here, at least virtually, at this Abinit uh, workshop. So I'm going to tell you um, a bit about a development we've been working on over the past um, couple of years that we call the Atomic Simulation Recipes, which is a, a, an, an, open, an open source Python-based framework and also a library creating workflows that can be automatically executed. Um, for example, for high throughput um, calculations, but not only for high throughput calculations. Uh, so let me start um, saying a little bit about the atomic simulation environment, because this was um, an inspiration for ASR. And, and we've also built the A in uh, uh, following a similar, you could say, philosophy um, as the ASE. So the, the ASE is a scripting environment that you can use to, to manage your um, atomistic simulations. And it's, uh, I think, one of the first Python-based tools. Uh, nowadays, there are those, as you might know. Um, but this was really one of the first, if not the first. And the, the main idea there was to regard the DFT codes as some external engines that could come to forces, then provide that to the, um, to the Python framework. And then <clears throat> um, this one could um, implement different types of functionalities, for example, relaxations, molecular dynamics, and other things. Um, and, and in that could um, develop, that could be used with many different DFT sort of decouple a lot of functionality from the DFT codes. Um, and it's a rather big community effort. I think there have been about or more than 250 contributors to the ASE so far. Uh, and this is just a very simple schematic of the idea behind the ASE. Um, so the main object here is the atom subject, and you can hook a calculator atom subject, and there are many different uh, codes, including Abinit that can work with ASE, and then there can be different um, types of dynamics attached to the atoms. You can apply constraints and uh, perform different types of analysis uh, and visualization tools. And um, this is, okay, this is getting very specific, but this is just to show you um, how an ASE script could look like, just to give you a flavor, a flavor of, of, of what it looks like when you work with uh, so it's basically simple, simple Python uh, codes, as you can see here. This is an example of a of a dynamics simulation of a small uh, FCC copper um, uh, cluster, um, some vacuum around it, and then one of the atoms is giving uh, is, is is given some atom, and then um, a Verle algorithm is used to perform the uh, the dynamics for a number of of, um, of time steps. Uh, okay, and again, um, a historical note on the development of the ASC. This is the first version. Uh, this is in terms of uh, the number of lines of codes. And over here, you can see the, the version uh, 3.0, which is the, uh, the most recent version of the ASC. And one thing you can, you can see if you compare these two graphs is that in the, in the later version here, there is a lot more uh, tests. So, so this is obviously very important when you develop codes um, that you continually create tests. Um, um. Okay, so let me now, okay, this is just to show that it's a very active um, project. This is the number of, of um, issues on GitLab uh, that have been created closed and uh, there's been close to 1,000 uh, merge requests for the project um, as of today. These are the different DFT codes that, um, that AS is interface to, and you can see Abinit up here, but there are many other DFT codes. And then of course, the, the, the idea is that um, you have one script and then you can um, easily um, apply different DFT codes to perform the same, uh, to the same ASC script, right? That's just a matter of how you calculate uh, the energies and the forces. I should also say that ASE 
it it started out as being just um, a, a frame doing sort of things with the atoms structure and 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 energy, but now it there are also functionality that supports band structures and wave functions and electron densities. So it's not just about forces and total uh, today. Okay, so now let me um, uh, switch to the uh, atomic simulation recipes. The ASR, it, it is a, similar to the ASE, it's a framework for managing not atoms, but calculations. So that's the main difference. Um, and also the data that, that the calculations produce. Uh, you can use it to create workflows, automatic workflows that are, that are useful for high throughput computations. Um, it's simple and modular and flexible. Um, I'll come back to why that is, that is the case. It's open source, you can find it on GitLab. And um, currently it actually works only with the GPOL code as calculator. But the idea is the long-term goal of this, um, and this is part of the, of the NOMAD um, Center of Excellence, the European Center of Excellence, um, and there, the long-term goal is that the ASR should work with a, a lot of different DFT codes, okay, including the Avinit code. We're working on that currently. Okay, so here is a, a graphical overview of, of the ASR. Um, the, the core of ASR consists of um, the recipe library which a recipe is actually also a concept. I'll come back to on the next slide what, what a recipe really is. Um, and then there is a caching system or a caching functionality that takes care of storing the simulation results and maintaining the data and, and, and the data provenance. So all the metadata pertaining to a given calculation that makes it possible to reproduce that calculation at a later time. And then there is a lot of things uh, around here that I'll also talk about. And you can see the recipes here. This is where the actual calculations are performed. They talk to the DFT codes over here, uh, electronic structure codes via the atomic simulation environment. So we, um, we leverage this um, interface that ASE already ha has to different DFT codes. So that we also make use of in the, in the ASR. So let me let me start with the core here and this this recipe. So a recipe is 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 really a, an ASE Python script that can perform a, a relatively well defined simulation task that could be a structure or calculating a band structure or Raman spectrum or whatever, um, and it should do that in a robust way, and it should do it accurately. And time it should keep track of all the data provenance. That means, for example, the input parameters that were, um, that were used to perform the calculation. And that should be done automatically. So these recipes are independent objects. So they can, they can uh, sort of do all the logging of the metadata related to that calculation, can do that itself. So in that sense, they're independent objects. And therefore, you can put them together as modules and create um, fairly advanced workflows just in, 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 in Python. So that gives you a lot of freedom for constructing your, your uh, workflows as, as you like them. So the recipe. Um, so here is a, a picture of a recipe. So, so this is a recipe and you can see this recipe, it's a Python script and it consists of smaller parts that we call, these are really functions, Python functions, we call them instructions. And let me, before I continue here, let me just go back and tell you what an instruction is. So this is an instruction. An instruction is, is, a, is a Python function. That's the orange part here. That's really where the, the action takes place. That's where you have to put your input. Um, and then the blue stuff surrounding the Python function is the caching layer. So what the caching layer does it, it, um, it takes the input arguments that, that the function here is, is, is called with, and then it checks first whether that particular calculation has already been done before. It, it goes into the cache, which is basically just, just a hidden directory in, in the folder, and checks whether uh, that record 
So a record is the output. Any, any function, any instruction should create a record. Okay, that's the output. So it checks the cache whether a record uh, corresponding to this, this exact calculation has performed. If it has, it just retrieves that record from the cache and returns it. If not, it evaluates the function, creates the record, the cache, and returns the record. That's an instruction. And now a recipe can consist of a number of such instructions. Um, and a given recipe can call instructions that are part of the same recipe, and it can also call instructions from other recipes, as you can show, as you can see here, indicated by these orange arrows. Okay, and then as, as mentioned, the output of such an instruction is what we call, and that's just a, a Python data structure that contains, of course, the result of that instruction. Um, and when you write the instruction, you have to, to, to uh, uh, tell the code, of course, how the result should be organized as a data file, as, as a data object. Then it also contains the version of that particular instruction. It contains the input arguments with which the instruction was called, a unique ID, all the dependencies, meaning what other instructions were called as part of this instruction. So which other instructions did this instruction call? Uh, and then something that we call migrations, I'll come back to that, and the resources that were used on the supercomputer system to perform the calculation. So that is, uh, and then of course, typically uh, part of the input arguments will be some, some atomic structure that is also saved here. So let me give you one example of a recipe that we have made. Um, this is a recipe for calculating effective masses of uh, semiconductors. So what the recipe does in short is it local position of the conduction band minimum. These are two different materials here. Um, it localizes the position of the conduction band minimum and the valence band maximum in the brillouin zone. Then it performs a, a fine sampling uh, um, of, the, uh, of the bands around that region and it makes a fit. So it computes the, the effects of mass and then it uh, calculates the deviation between your parabolic fit and the actual back in a region up to 25 MeV above the, uh, the bottom of the band here. And this is used to calculate a mean absolute re relative error for the fit that in this case is 136%, it's only 2%. And this is just a histogram showing the distribution of such mean absolute relative errors for I think 2000 different semiconductors. Uh, so apart from giving you the effective mass, it also gives you an estimate of how accurate parabolic of the band is. So that's the kind of things that you can put into these recipes, um, because this takes some time to implement, of course, but once it's done, you can use it again and again. So it's, it's worth the effort in this, in this sense. And why uh, should you use recipes? It has this automatic locking of all the metadata. Um, you get high uh, data quality because a lot of time hopefully has been spent in developing the recipe. So it does the calculation correctly. Um, you can take of post-processing like this calculation of the mean absolute relative error on the fit. Um, and uh, right, using, using these recipes also would lower the entry barrier into new into calculating new types of properties that you're not familiar with because you just take this recipe that someone who's an expert has developed for you and then you can um, apply that in, in your research without necessarily being a technical expert on that type of calculation. Just keep an eye on the time here. Okay, so we have made a, a, a small library now of uh, a bit more than 40 different recipes. And most of them are GPOR specific, and, um, but they can be used as templates. Say you want to make a recipe now uh, that works with Appinit, you take um, a recipe that works with the GPOR code, and then you, uh, you know, in the, in the simplest possible case, you make a search and replace GPOR with Appinit, and then it just works. And of course, in reality, it's not that simple. And some recipes might be more difficult to transfer to a different DFT code and others might be simpler. Uh, the goal is that the recipe should really be DFT code independent so that, um, you know, for example, if uh, a recipe to effective mass, 
um, can be used with whatever DFT code that you that you like to use. Okay, a little bit about the GPOR code. I think I will skip that um, in the uh, interest of time. Okay, so that was the core of the ASR. There, there are a number of, of user interfaces to ASR. One is a command line interface that uh, makes it possible just from the command line to run recipes and uh, inspect the cache, look at the results in the cache. Um, it could look something like this, um, AS and then uh, LS and then a name of a recipe. This will list all the records in the cache that have been produced by the ground state recipe. You can also execute a recipe or run a recipe with the run command. Uh, here's another example. Um, you, you perform um, a band structure calculation, and then you say afterwards what you say results, and then you get this nice plot of the band structure, including this plot of the Brill ring zone, where you can see the VBM and the CBM marked here. And um, you can even put, you can even look at this in a browser. So a recipe contains different parts, different instructions, and one of them must be. Uh, a small a, a part that presents the data or the result of that recipe as a figure for uh, or as a table or whatever you find is most appropriate for the type of, of uh, property the recipe computes and it should also be able to show itself in a browser so with an extra uh, command here i would be able to put this here into a browser so i could access it uh, directly from a browser and that that's actually very convenient so that's the command line interface. It also has a Python interface that uh, speaks for itself. So you can call the recipes. You can look into the cache directly from, from. And then there is also um, um, a task scheduler front end here. It's a front end to the actual scheduler on your HPC system. So now uh, Slurm and PBS, and that is actually good a separate um, um, module or code program with, that we've developed that we call MyQ that does this. So that, that just makes it very simple to look at, at, to talk to the HPC scheduler. This is something that can be quite tricky in general, but MyQ makes that a lot easier. And MyQ can then, yeah, let me say a bit more about MyQ. Um, here, as I say, uh, right here, it's a personal decentralized um, so a lot is going on in the chat. Maybe I should just check here if it's something, um, questions to me. I don't know. Okay. I don't think so. No, Christian, just uh, go on. And if there is a time, uh, we move to the questions okay. later. Okay. I don't, I don't bother about that now. So, um, so it's a front end for schedulers. Um, makes it easy to overview the status of your jobs. Your jobs get sort of done, queued, failed. Uh, words attached to them. Uh, you can work with this from the command line, and there is also a Python interface. And if you want to do workflows, you can do that in Python. Um, and to do that, you def define what, what we call a dependency tree of tasks. And a task could, for example, be a recipe, but it doesn't have to be that. So the uh, MyQ is independent of ASR in that sense. And, and uh, such a dependency tree of task takes this form. If task X is done, then submit task Y. Uh, and this is all in, in Python. So of course you can all uh, usual Python uh, in, your, in your workflow. And the task, as I said, could be ASR recipe to execute, but doesn't have to be. Then we have a database module as well. And um, this is really uh, some tools, a module with tools for working with ASC databases. ASC databases are some very um, easy to work with databases. They can be ported into different formats, SQLite, uh, PostgreSQL, and so on and so forth. And we have some nice, um, um, say, um, commands for working with these ASC databases. For example, ASR will create uh, it works with files and folders. So once you're done with an ASR project, you will have a folder tree with all your records. That, that's the output of, your, of, your, of the recipes that have been run. Then you can turn this into a database, an ASE database here. 
And you can also go the other way around with a simple command. So if you have an ASE database, you can unfold that into a folder tree, which is very useful if you have a project that you want to continue working on. If you only have the database for that project, you can unfold that to a folder tree, and then you can continue working with that, and you can go back and create a database um, afterwards again. You can um, create web pages to present such ASC databases on the web. I'll give an example in a minute. And you can create links between rows of the same uh, database or between different databases. Okay, so let me give you one example where we've used the ASR. Um, and this is uh, the C2DB, which is a, a database of 2D materials and have about 4,000 different 2D, 2D materials in that database. And what is really unique about it is that it contains a very large number of different properties calculated for these 4,000 2D materials using the. And to begin with, C2DB developed um, in parallel with the ASR. So we didn't have the ASR to begin with, and it was really painful to perform all these thousands of calculations without having a proper framework for, for doing that. And so we developed the ASR parallel, and um, I think this is also, you know, it, it, we learned it the hard way, but, but I don't think there's really any way around. If you want to develop something like a workflow uh, a tool, you need to have a, a real example to guide you um, to find out how to best design that, that workflow tool. Um, we can actually create the C2 database with a single command. So we have, we have this workflow file. Um, if, we, if we write this command here, we will then launch um, about 60,000 individual DFT calculations for these 4,000 different materials. So these will be uh, ASR recipes that are, that are launched in this process. And in, look at the, of the calculations, the DFT calculations, the success rate is, is very close to 100%. So most of these calculations just run and create uh, output as they should, and they very rarely fail. Okay, here's a list of all the different properties that we compute um, as part of this workflow. So it's really what you could call a characterization workflow. Um, so lots of different properties are, are calculated here uh, in an automatic fashion for all these different different uh, materials. So we really have a, a more or less full characterization of these materials afterwards. And um, this is, this is fully online. And this database here, you can go and browse it uh, online uh, or you can download it if you want to from, from Python. But this is just to show you what it looks like when you use the ASR to create uh, websites um, to present your databases. Um, so that's the, the front page here. You write um, a material that you're interested in and you get a list of all the materials with containing molybdenum and sulfur in this case. You click on the one uh, on the structure you, you, you want to look closer into, and then you get uh, all the data here and you have all the different panels here that uh, contains the result of the various recipes that have been computed. Um, you can click these questions that gives you a, a general description of uh, the data that has been computed here um, and which recipes that have been uh, used to produce the data. And there could be some relevant articles here that you can link to. If you call itself, you you should you get the result of that obviously, and um, this is for example the Raman spectrum of uh, of MOS two, and this is the band structure up here. So finally, if I have uh, one minute left, I just want to say that often when you or should I should I wrap up? Uh, very fast, I think. Okay. Very 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 fast. Very yeah. fast. Data migration is about updating and, and um, um, maintaining your data over time. So it, it often happens that you, you, you need to make an update of a recipe. And then of course the data that were previously created with that recipe becomes um, uh, outdated. And now we have, we have uh, migration tools you can use to bring that data 
up to date with the newest version of your of your recipe library. So in that sense, um, you know you can uh, you can keep your your databases up to date um, with with versions of your recipes. Okay, with that, I just want uh, to um, I think I'll just leave uh, this page. It summarizes what I've said, uh, but I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just flash this slide here. And if you're interested in more, you can go and read the Psyche highlight from, from April, where we present the ASR in more detail. And I should remember to thank the people who actually did the work, Morten Gerding, uh, developed the idea for the ASR and did a lot of, of, of the code ASR, also together with Jens Jørn Mortensen and Asgjord Larsen. Fabian Torbjörn at Asgjörn also contributed to it. And um, thanks to Nomad for, for support and DSC as well. And thank you for the attention. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, you have several questions. I think that we don't have time maybe for all, but uh, Gianmarco was the first one to uh, book uh, <laughs> a question. Okay. So please, uh, Gianmarco. Hi, Christian. Uh, so as you know, there are other tools to do, uh, you know, workflow management. I'm thinking about AIDA, Fireworks, and so on. And so here, as developers of Abinit, I mean, if we want to, you know, make Abinit usable with the different workflow managers, there's always uh, different efforts to be done. So how do you see things? Is there going to be something that basically links uh, the different codes to the different workflow managers? And so wait, this goes in the direction of a, a question that Mathieu is asking about the manpower. So you imagine that we as developers, if we want to link to all these, because all of them are kind of important, so we have to make a different effort each time. And this we clearly cannot afford. So what's your view on that? Mm. So hopefully the effort won't be that, that much. I mean, we are going to use uh, the ASC interface that is already there to some extent. But of course, though, we are working currently on, on extending those, those interfaces to various DFT codes. But of course, we need your help. I mean, if, if we cannot do the interfaces to all the, the 35 different DFT codes, so it would be great to um, to have to have some man served um, on the Abinit side, um, but but um, you know once once we've done this for a few DFT codes, I think it will be fairly easy to to create to create interfaces to uh, to other types at least to other types of DFT codes at least if they are in the same uh, code family. Um, so. Yeah, that's that's the short answer. Yeah, thank you. But I, you know, um, I'm not sure what you were aiming at in terms of manpower. Uh, we will do an no, effort. No, no. I, th I think that what you what you say is it makes sense is to to have a, let's say a unique entrance which is ASC, and this ASC could then be connected to the different uh, workflow managers in some way. So we yes. would just have to work on ASC. Yes, exactly. So maybe we can uh, uh, compact the two questions of, uh, I think it was Mark and Philippe, which basically ask you um, how you will uh, manage inside your uh, um, platform, let's say, the fact that some properties, some codes, the codes have different outputs. And also, uh, just to, to book the things that you might have different recipes uh, for a given task. So mm. basically extracting mm. magnetic parameters, phonons that you can do with finite differences or mm. things like that. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know where this will end. I mean, I, mean I, I don't have the final answer to that question because it's obviously a very, very complex task to do something like this that will work for all the DFT codes. That, that is the, the ultimate goal. But I think for now, there is a lot of, of, of the functionality in the ASR that can be useful. If you're a developer or, or, or a user of the Abinit, you might take the ASR and, and make your own recipes. You know, you that you have this awesome um, locking of all the metadata, this caching mechanism, all the stuff that uh, makes the websites for you to look at your data online, that is actually independent of the actual uh, a DFT code. You can write your own little scripts as you did before, but now you just do it within the ASR framework. And that makes life a lot simpler for you. 
I think also in the long run, it, may, it makes it easier to, um, in a sustainable way, develop scripts that performs different types of calculations. So we don't end up in this situation that we are often in, that a PhD student does a lot of work, creates scripts that performs different calculations and then leaves the group. And then with that, all the scripts uh, that, that were created are, are, are basically gone. This, is a, this will allow you to, to, to create such scripts in a way that they automatically sort of documented and tested and all these things, because that's part of writing a recipe. So maybe in the future, people will have their own ASR library of recipes and they're not, they won't one sort of central uh, library body uses. I don't know how this will develop. So this is a very pragmatic approach that we've taken. We don't that to begin with, we didn't want to make one big, uh, you know, system that everybody could use and that could solve all the problems in the world. We started by doing something that could, uh, you know, solve the problem we had. And then, you know, hopefully this can be extended and it's very flexible and it's very sort of simple in the approach that I, I, I think it should be useful. But um, yeah.